Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hugh in the ReliefFactor.com studio. One of my favorite interviews inside the Beltway is Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar, because he's one of the really smart people inside the Beltway with a very diverse background. He also has to work for Ludig, so he's, we're always trying to be nice to him because he don't, doesn't recover from that for a long time. Secretary Azar, welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Hey, Hugh, it's great to be back with you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to begin on the border briefly, but I want to preface it by saying yesterday I had lunch with uh, Margaret Weikert, who is, like I was years ago, the acting director of OPM, and I I sat down over the the weekend with one of your colleagues, Christina. I know how hard career government employees are working to try and take care of the immigrants at the border. I know that. I don't think the media reflects how hard people are trying, but they are just overwhelmed. Am I correct? Oh, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the just the for my colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security, the scurrilous attacks and uh, just horrible things said about the the professionals at Customs and Border Patrol, and 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 here with at HHS, we have the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which works on sheltering these kids, the kids who come into the country unaccompanied by themselves. And these are child welfare workers that run this program, and they're so dedicated, so passionate about caring for these kids. And and then you just hear so many false, scurrilous attacks that undermine the program, and frankly, just make it actually make it harder to run it because they scare grantees and others away from being willing to work with us to care for these kids. Um, why would you want to get into the, into that 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 work uh, and be subjected to those kinds of protesters and just? Horrible, horrible language associated with it. And these are dedicated career child welfare people. They're they're deeply passionate about taking care of these kids. I would I would venture to say that I've talked to David Miliband in person once and off air uh, via the internet. Uh, we're trying to get him on from the International Rescue uh, uh, Committee. I don't think there's a, a, a daylight between you and he on how people ought to be treated when they are in the custody of a government from which they have not received permission to enter. I'll bet you you have the same value set. Do you agree with me? I absolutely would agree with that. I think everybody ought to be treated with respect, ought to be treated humanely, uh, ought to be provided safe, secure conditions. Uh, and that is what we always aspire to do with the children in the ORR program here at HHS. Uh, we operate under court order. and. We're always trying to make it better, um, and uh, right now we're in a crisis, though, Hugh, as you know. Uh, the We're out of capacity, and we're out of money because we've seen a flood of these unaccompanied kids coming into the country. We already this year have had um, as many kids come in as came in in the entirety of last year. So in early to mid-July, we're going to run out of money and have to run on basically a government shutdown operation and we don't have capacity, and so that's when you see kids backed up at the border at these CBP facilities. And those DHS CBP facilities, they weren't built to house kids. They weren't built to house migrant families. You know, they had 80,000 people within migrant families come in just last month, over 11,000 unaccompanied kids just last month. I, I really don't know how you handle 11,000 unaccompanied kids. I know we will, but the Congress needs to get you money. I believe Mitch McConnell has made that point on the show last week. Is he correct that, that they need to act immediately? Absolutely. We appreciate the bipartisan leadership in the Senate trying to drive this. This has to be a bipartisan effort, and it's got to be immediate. Immediate. It's got to happen now. All right. So let me let me move to yesterday's uh uh, executive order. I played the president's audio, and I want to go back, Alex Azar. I mentioned you clerked for our friend Michael Ludig. You also clerked for Justice Scalia. You probably learned Virginia State Board of Pharmacy uh, early on in your First Amendment class. I teach it every year where Justice Blackman says, as to the particular consumer's interest in the free flow of commercial information, that interest may be as keen, if not keener by far, than his interest in the day's most urgent political debate. In other words, most Americans care a lot more about the price of their medicine and their doctor than they do about what they see on cable. How did you advance that truth yesterday? Well, President Trump signed an executive order that I think will go down as one of the most important steps in the history of American health reform. It will arm patients with price and quality information about their health care. That's going to let them get the affordability they need, the options and control that they want, and the quality they deserve. You know, Hugh, 
this is going up against the special interests, um, which is sort of what the president, President Trump and I specialize in uh, for decades now. Republicans and Democrats have said we need greater price and quality transparency to actually create a market in health care that could function and lead to lower cost and higher quality. Well, but the vested interests, the special interests, don't want that to happen. President Trump has the courage to do that and to, to demand that. And I guess I'd say to, to those special interests, you sort of have a choice to make. Um, the status quo of this opaque, non-market, um, inefficient system isn't going to hold. And you can go the way a single payer and government control, or you can try to actually build a market and, and have a, the patient at the center, the patient in control, but you've got to enable it. And to enable it, you need price and quality information. Where else in our economy do you not have price and quality information and consumers? So they got to help us make, they got to make that choice because it's going to be one of those paths. Now, when I was playing the president's um, uh, audio, he, he kept talking about how revolutionary this is. Do a touch and feel for us, Secretary Azar, in terms of what will it look like to the consumer? How will they see it manifest that transparency and pricing is coming about? Absolutely. Let me give you the clearest example. Um, the second element here is to require that insurance companies provide you with information before you get a service. So right now, Hugh, when you or I go to the doctor or the hospital, a couple weeks later, we get in our mailbox an explanation of benefits, an EOB. And that tells you what the list price of the procedure you had was. It tells you what the negotiated discount, the actual negotiated discount that your insurance company did with the provider. And it tells you what you'll owe out of pocket given your insurance benefit. Well, that comes after the fact. There is not a daggone reason why that can't be given to you before you get the service done and you can comparison shop. And that's what the president's going to require is that kind of advanced explanation of benefits. Now, okay, so, uh, can I pause for a second? If, if you've been to the British Museum like I have, you've seen the Rosetta Stone. And, and the Rosetta Stone is amazing because it helps you translate. It was the key to translating everything. I get explanation of benefits and i've got a jd and i taught con law for 25 years and i do broadcast i cannot read them secretary azar yep. can anybody in your department oblige people to use english <laughs> so um here's the even i think probably even the bigger thing that's going to happen out of the president's executive order is we're going to unleash data so the the federal government has claims data from the Veterans Administration, from Medicare, from Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, DOD, and the President ordered us yesterday to make that information available in a de-identified way while protecting patient safety and security out there for the public and vendors to look at, to research on, and to create tools that are accessible for people. So you're right, Hugh. We in the government, and let's be honest, even insurance companies aren't often terribly good at providing information in a way that consumers, that patients find usable. But there are a lot of entities out there that know how to do this. I mean, just, you know, think about the household names that do this. And if you simply make that kind of that rich pool of data available, it will create the tools that people will use. I don't know what they'll look like, because if I did, I'd be a multi-billionaire running one of those companies. But you expect the market to take big data that is released in a way that protects patient privacy and package it in a way that will be able to direct a consumer like a Yelp directory directs them to a restaurant? Because that's actually what people need to know. They need to know the quality of the, the doctor or physician's assistance or emergency room or urgent care facility. They need to know the pricing at you know a CVS versus a Rite Aid versus a Costco. They need to know where to go. And do you think that big data will be uh, will enable third-party providers to, to package it that way. Absolutely. Hewitt does that in every other segment of our economy. We just have to unlock the non-transparent, opaque pricing and quality information and claims information that's currently locked up, and that's what President Trump is doing with this executive order, is he's saying, get on with it. Hospitals, disclosure, negotiated, the information based on your negotiated rates, insurance companies, tell people before they get a service what it's going to cost. Um, and, you know, some of the vested interests, they come back and they say, oh, people don't shop for health care. Well, they don't shop because there's not a market for health care. When you don't have price and quality information, there's not a market. And, and also they say, well, uh, what about an emergency room? This isn't when you're racing off in an ambulance to the emergency room. But the simple fact is... 70, 70 percent of inpatient hospital services are what you would call shoppable, 
and 93% of outpatient services at hospitals are shoppable. This can be done. There can actually be a consumer marketplace in healthcare. We just have to empower it. So my last question, Secretary Azar, uh, who is pushing back? I assume Big Pharma doesn't like it. I know you are a, it's an admission against interest because you came out of Big Pharma, but you've been a critic of Big Pharma when necessary. But I'm, I'm interested what they think. And then doctors, because there's a bell curve of doctors. And so bad doctors are not going to want this to come fo- forward. And high-priced doctors are not going to want this to come forward. But it, it, will the it, will the executive order roll over objections which are not based in other than self-interest? So the president has proven time and time again that he's willing to take on these special interests to put the American patient at the center and empower them so that they can be in control of their own health care. And that's exactly what he's going to do here. Um, listen, there's a reason these special interests don't want this kind of transparency. They've got a good gig going. The president isn't standing up for them. He's standing up for the American worker, the American people who need this information so they can be genuinely in control of their health care and treated like people, not like numbers manipulated by a system, but empowered as individuals. That's President Trump's health care philosophy. And Secretary Azar, I, I lied. Last question now. If there's an executive order that means regs have to follow, what is your anticipated regulatory schedule for the first batch of regs that follow the EO? Yes, so the most immediate requirement is 60 days for hospital transparency on information based on negotiated rates, and then I believe it's 90 days for uh, the Department of Labor, Treasury, and us at HHS to get the insurance regulations out. And do you think you'll make those deadlines? (laughs) My boss is very demanding. I intend to meet every deadline set by the president. Secretary Alex Azar, always a pleasure. Come back and keep us posted on this. I, I do greatly appreciate your taking the time to talk about the border as well. Thank you, Secretary. You bet you.